If God had to make signs to wake up the church, I don't think we could get more of a sign. This is more than any generation that we have seen. We're going to talk about signs, all right? The subject today is sign. It's, we're going to talk about the American uh, solar eclipse. But before we do that, I want to talk to you about the word sign. God gives signs. How many of you believe that? Yeah? God gives signs. So here's a word. Anyone here know what that word is? Some of you who have studied some Hebrew. No one. Anybody know what this word is in Hebrew? Mazel tov. Mazel tov. Everyone say mazel tov. Mazel tov means what? Come on. People who have been to Israel with me, we say mazel tov when we want to congratulate someone. Right? At weddings, mazel tov. You get a promotion, mazel tov. What does that mean? Well, technically it means Congratulations or good luck is what a lot of people say these days. But um, it comes from two words, muzzle and tov. Muzzle is the same root as the Mazaroth, which means the constellation. Tov is good. So what are you saying? When the Jews say this, they're saying constellation good or may it be in a good sign. So when the Jews say the word sign, what are they referring to? We might have our own ideas, right? But what do the Jews refer to? In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 22, remember, remember 22 is the number of? Anybody alert here? I've had this book out for 10 years. Do my church members read this? 22, number of the Jews. I will remind you again of this, again and again. 22, the number of end times, the number of the Jews. And so not surprisingly, in verse 22 of 1 Corinthians chapter 1, Paul said, for the Jews require a sign. Everyone say sign. sign. And the Greeks seek after wisdom. The Greeks here refer to the Gentiles, us, people who are non-Jew. What happens a lot in Australia, I'm sure it's the same in Canada, America, is uh, Christians get into a debate. Atheists like to get into a debate. Why? Because the Gentiles seek after knowledge, wisdom. They like to debate, but the Jews don't want that kind of evidence of who is the Messiah. They want signs. In fact, I know one rabbi who found the Messiah simply because he just added up some gematria. Uh, Yahweh equals 26. And then, uh, what's the other one? Yahweh plus Miriam. I forget the exact number. I think it's 190. Anyway, you add those two together, and it's the same as the gematria Yeshua. So if you add God plus Mary, the virgin, their two gematria equal the name of Jesus. And based on that, he found the Messiah. Now, I bet you nobody here who's a non-Jew non would be convinced of that. You'd be like, oh, that's just numerology, especially Christians these days. Christians do not even pay attention to the signs that the Bible is talking about. But the Jews do. So the way that we reach Jews and the way we reach Gentiles will be different. I think that shouldn't come as a surprise. So when the Bible says that God gives us signs, I think that we need to not superimpose our own Gentile ideas about what a sign is. To the Jews, a constellation is a sign because the word sign means constellation. Gematria is considered among Jewish rabbis a sign. In fact, they made a comment to me, a rabbi made a comment to me that we Gentiles, we Christians, read the Bible naked. I said, what do you mean? He said, it's like you haven't even put your clothes on and you're sitting there reading the Bible. The way we read the Bible is considered very surface level, which is good. You need to understand what the text says. That's not wrong. But the rabbis who spend all their life studying the Word of God want to know what's in the subtext. 
want to know what's in the gematria because in the Jewish mentality, this leads to that. Something that has the same sign leads to the other thing. Something that has the same gematria leads to another thing. And that's how they study the word. Again, this is completely lost among most Christians. And it's not your fault because it's been lost among us pastors. We're not taught this and we're taught to be, uh, we're dissuaded from even understanding this. But when we see that the Bible says, for the Jews require a sign, please explain it to me. And the Gentile pastors would fail to explain that because they don't know what the Hebrew culture and the Hebrew roots of this is. A sign includes things in the sky and gematria, biblical gematria, not some strange numerology. Now, we want to come to a, another sign, something that the Jews would consider a sign in the sky, which is the total solar eclipse that is going to cross the United States mainland on the 21st of August, 2017. We are only days away from this. I hesitated a lot to present this. I know a lot of other people have done a good job presenting this, um, piggybacking off uh, of some information that one of our ministry friends sent me. I don't think it's his real name. I think he used a pseudonym because he signed off just in time. I don't think just in time is a real name, but anyway, I give credit where credit is due. I get a lot of information from friends, and I'm very thankful for that. I'm sorry if I don't always say thank you, and I can't always reply to everybody, but just in time uh, sent me this, and also um, Mark Bilt has been a real pioneer in looking at the signs in the sky, and we, we owe a lot of um, our research to him, so thank God for his ministry, too. All right, so let's take a look at this, because I, as I said, I hesitated for a while, but I've pieced together a few things that might be of special note, special interest to you, things that are remarkable. Let's go to the Word of God concerning the, the idea of signs. First chapter of Genesis. No better place to begin. Verse 14. On the fourth day of creation, remember that number four, on the fourth day of creation, God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night. Let them be for four things. For signs, would you like to say signs? And for seasons, this is not winter, spring, summer, fall. The word is moedim. Moedim refers to the holidays or the feasts of the Lord. A lot of Christians don't pay attention to them. They got Easter and Christmas. And they're not even teaching their children to celebrate them. Well, God celebrates them. These are four seasons, the Moedim, the feasts of the Lord. And what else are they for? And they're for days and years. If Gentiles wrote the Bible, we would have said God created the sun and the moon for days and months and years. And that's about it. We wouldn't say they're for signs, especially these days. We consider that maybe superstition, maybe something that the ancients, they're ignorant, they don't know anything, and they paid attention to that. Actually, we find a lot of times they know more than we do. We just forgot what they knew. So the Bible says, first of all, the sun and the moon are up in the sky for signs. Then the Bible says the disciples ask for signs. So God will sometimes give signs. He doesn't want you to love signs. Some people end up worshiping the signs, following the signs. Then that becomes astrology, numerology. Of course, that's wrong. You're forgetting the creator who made those signs to point to himself not to point to you or your fortune. So the sun is a sign, the moon is a sign, how so? Let's take a look at this. Do you realize that a total solar eclipse is only possible on Earth? No other planet that we know, certainly no planet that we're aware of in the solar system, can experience a total solar eclipse. Why is that? Because the sun's diameter is 400 times larger than the moon's, but at the same time, the sun also happens to be 400 times farther away than the moon. Now, as I said to you, the Hebrews, every one of their letters means something. Each letter has a gematria value, and it also has a picture, a concept associated with it. Well, the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet is tav. Everyone say tav. Tav. And the letter, or this letter is associated with the image of a sign. It means a sign. And guess what? Its gematria value is 400. You can't make this stuff up. 
Unless you knew astronomy 3,000 years ago, why would you say that a sign has the numerical value 400? Because the person who made the Hebrew alphabet made the sun and made it 400 times bigger in diameter than the moon and put it 400 times away so that they could perfectly cover, the moon could cover the sun perfectly because the two disks sometimes will look exactly the same size. That's a sign. On the fourth day, he made that sign. He gave it a value 400, and he put the distance 400. He made the size 400 bigger. That's our God. This is why what we're believing, what we're reading, is not something made up. It's not another religious text. It's not another man-made fiction. It's something that is objectively true. I follow Jesus because he's true, not because it's convenient, not because I grew up in a Christian family. I didn't. I chose Jesus because he is true. And I'd rather follow something true even if it's inconvenient and even if it seems unhelpful sometimes. Because God seeks those who will worship him in spirit and in truth. That means you cannot have any, any shadiness about you, any dishonesty about you, any lies about you. If you want to follow God, you have to be honest to, to God. And that's the thing that really keeps people from coming to God. It's not a lack of evidence. The evidence is right there in the sky. It's right there in the text. It's in every letter of the Hebrew alphabet. It's in math. It's in science. It's in people's personal lives. What keeps people away from Jesus? They're dishonest. They're dishonest about who they are. They think they're better than other people. They think they're smarter than God. They think God is wrong and they're right. These are falsehoods. You know, truth, truth and humility go together. The only way to be humble is to accept the truth. God is never to blame for anything. He is a good God. And if there's something that we think that God is wrong, no, we are wrong, and we need to find out and understand a little bit more. And we probably will never see everything that God sees, in, even in our own situation. So it's hard to understand sometimes, but if you stay with God, he will show it to you. So you need to humble yourself. God has certainly given you signs. See, we don't like the word sign. The Greeks, the Gentiles, we like the word evidence. See, we, we stake our our knowledge, we stake our salvation in knowledge. So we'll we'll prefer the word evidence, Westerners. But Easterners like signs. Signs are good. Signs are objective. All right, as I said, there's a table of the Hebrew alphabet or Aleph bet. There's uh, 22 letters and Tav is given the gematria value of 400. All right, there it is. I underline it for you. And there's the ancient way of writing, and interestingly, Tav would have just simply be, been written as a cross. So when Jesus says, I'm the Alpha and the Omega, he really said, I'm the Alev Tav. The Alev is the, is the strong one, looks like an ox, right? I am the ox on the cross. I'm the strong one on the cross. I'm the animal sacrifice on the cross. It's even there in picture form, so if you're Jewish, Who's the Messiah? There it is in your first and last letter of the Aleph Bet. No one else went to the cross for you. But I think the rabbis figured it out at some point that this is quite revealing, so they even changed the Tav over time and made it a different shape. But it's undeniable the original shape of the Tav was a cross. That's where we get all of our letters from, eh? All right, the Bible says that the sun is a sign. The sun is a sign. There are unique things about the sun, probably more than we can figure out, but we've, I think, touched on one of them. The solar eclipse is a sign. What else might be a sign? Well, here's an interesting thing. What do you think is the temperature of the surface of the sun? Anyone know? Well, here it is. It says the surface temperature of the sun is 5,778 Kelvin. Now, That's a very interesting number because the next Hebrew year is 5,778. That's coming one or two days 
before the Revelation 12 sign. So 5778 roughly equals R2018. Is that a coincidence or is that a sign? God loves to play with words and images and numbers and he can do what he like. Yeah, some people won't accept this. A lot of Christians are not taught this, so they'll say, oh, it's just a coincidence. As the rabbis say, and I'll quote, coincidence is not a kosher word. There is no coincidence with God. It's a God incident. Now, Jesus said this, and a lot of Christians may interpret this one Scripture. They will isolate this one scripture to say Jesus will not give a sign. No, that's not what he said. He said that the Pharisees, he called them an evil and adulterous generation, seeks for a sign, meaning they're not seeking for the Messiah. You seek the Messiah who give you lots of signs, but instead they were seeking for the sign itself. And then they end up, a lot of rabbis just end up in love with Gematria. And it is very lovable because there are so many amazing mystical mysterious things in the bible and you can end up missing the forest for the trees you end up missing the big picture because you're so you know micro studying every little detail because it is fun and interesting and he said that's evil you know it's like i I write a letter to you and you hate the person who gave the letter but you love the letter that's called loving the letter of the law yeah, you're supposed to love the person who gave the sign to you. So he said, an evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of Jonah. So even to the evil generation, he says, I'm still going to give you one sign. He's not saying God doesn't give signs. He says, for the evil, I'll give only one sign. But for those who love the Messiah, you can find many more than one sign. So he said, I'll give you, the evil ones, the sign of Jonah. Now, who was he speaking to? The wicked, the evil, the legalistic, the Pharisees. Now, we interpret that in our context. We read that as Christians. And so we say, what's the sign of Jonah? Well, Jonah ran away from the call of God, was eaten by a fish, you know, really actually died inside the fish, was resurrected after three days, and the fish spat him out. Jonah actually says he was in the depths of hell. All right? So he actually died resurrected and then spat out and we say there's a sign of jonah no sign's going to be given except the resurrection well that's very christian i understand that i am a christian i understand why you would say that but that would not be at all what the pharisees were, would be looking for and he said i'll give you a sign even if you're wicked and dense even if you won't believe me jesus and my death burial and resurrection for you I'll give you one sign, and it's called the sign of Jonah. What would that be? Well, if you ask Christians, they'll only say one thing. So you need to go back into history and think, what was the sign of Jonah? Because Jonah did something that nobody else has ever done. He goes into a city very reluctantly. He's a reluctant prophet. He, in fact, wants the people he preaches to dead. He hates them. Think about that. Has there ever been a missionary who hated the people that he was reaching and with a reluctant sermon, ends up converting the entire city. That is one of the most outstanding miracles in the entire Bible. Right? We wish we could do that. We wish we could walk into a city, preach, you know, well, Jesus died for you, take it or leave it, you know. Be really reluctant about it. Make it really, really hard. And the whole city of Melbourne says, Jesus, you are Lord. What have we been doing? What have we been thinking? Let's bring prayer and the Bible back into school. Let's everybody go to church. Let's close shop. Let's have a real Sabbath. Everybody's got to go to church every weekend. That's revival. That's what happened in Nineveh. And a lot of Christians cannot explain that because they ignore what Jesus said. There was a sign given to Nineveh called the sign of Jonah. What was that sign? Take a look at it. Today, Nineveh is called Mosul. So there's Mosul right there. And there was a total solar eclipse that crossed the north of Nineveh on the 15th of June, 763 B.C., during the reign of King Ashurdan III. This was one of the omens which led Nineveh to repent wholesale. Before Jonah arrived, it wasn't because he was such a great preacher. 
It was because the hearts of the people had been prepared through a series of omens and signs. The greatest of which, the most objective of which, was the solar eclipse passing almost directly overhead their city. You're out in the middle of the day and it suddenly turns dark, you pay attention. Say, what's going on? And the ancients were not so dumb. Dubbed the Bur Sagal Eclipse, it was one of the most famous solar eclipses in ancient history. In other words, when Jesus said there was a sign given during the time of Jonah, it wasn't that long ago in history from Jesus' perspective, and this sign was well known to the entire secular world. Why? Because it was recorded in cuneiform tablets called the Assyrian Eponym Canon. And this is something that was on earth in the 19th century. But back in those days, that was textbook stuff. That was child, like children's education. And when Jesus spoke to the Pharisees and said, you get one sign left. You're so resistant. You're so stubborn. I'll give you one sign. And you know what happened when Jesus was crucified? The sun turned to darkness. The Bible records it. Even if you're a Christian and you say, no, the sign of Jonah is only the resurrection, I understand your interpretation. I agree with it. But don't discount the fact that the sun turned to darkness. They turned to darkness, which confirmed for those Pharisees who were watching at that time. Didn't he say something about the sign of Jonah? And when Jesus is crucified, the earth quakes, day turns to night. He said, I'll give you only one sign. If you're wicked, and it came. Can you see the series of earthquakes that are going on right now? Turkey and Greece, unusual earthquake, a mini tsunami, went into the hotels in Turkey, at least two people dead in Greece. More to come. Earthquake and day turning to darkness, God says, for you the wicked. For those who are godly, read the Bible. You should better understand the plain words of God the Father. So, the sign of Jonah included at least five things. When you trace the history of the reign of Asher Dan III, you find that there were a series of plagues, civil wars, military loss, a major earthquake, and a total solar eclipse. If you look right now in America, it's almost like there is a civil war that's about to start. The division between people in America is almost 50-50, right down the line. It's never really had that kind of division since 1865, the Civil War. So, what are the signs of Jonah? At least the solar eclipse has to be taken into account. And I think that there's going to be an earthquake and maybe an upset military loss for America as well and plagues. Let's come a little bit closer to our time. What kind of signs does God give? On the 21st of August, 1914, a total solar eclipse crossed Eastern Europe. This was dubbed at that time the World War I eclipse. World War I started two months prior to, the prior to the solar eclipse with the assassination of Archduke Ferdinand on the 28th of June, 1914. And when war started, it started there on the Eastern Europe front. And when it started, two months into it, day turned to darkness. If they understood the signs of God, they should have just laid down their arms and said, this is going to be a waste of lives and time and money. And it's set that these two world wars set the course of change, you know, and I'm talking about radical and depressing change in our Western culture today. So much of what Western culture is is a result of the massive, you know, murder of young men in World War I and World War II. So, in a way, we're still recovering from that. Now, this is the map of the eclipse path of totality going across the United States, as I mentioned, on August 21st, 2017. 
It's going to start on the West Coast. The zone of totality will arrive on the West Coast at 17 116 hours, 16 minutes, all right? 1700 hours, 16 minutes. So 1716 UT time, that's universal time. This will overlap the Cascadia subduction zone. And what's interesting about this, two things. First of all, that it starts by crossing an earthquake zone. And Jerusalem, at that moment, is plus two UT time. So 1716 plus 2 is 1916 or 716 p.m. Why is that important? Because that just so happens to be the exact minute of sunset. So the sun goes dark in America and the sun goes dark in Jerusalem at the same time. They're not even at the same location, obviously. But that's pretty poetic, if not prophetic. There it is. It's, uh, the great American eclipse will start exactly at sunset in Jerusalem, which you can see right there is 1716 p.m. on the 21st. Also, the final Hebrew month, Elul, begins at sundown on which day? Monday, the 21st of August, 2017. What's Elul about? Here it is. Wikipedia says Elul is the 12th month of the Jewish civil new year. It comes from the Akkadian word, they say, that means harvest. So the solar eclipse happens at the first of Elul, which means the harvest begins. The word harvest means gathering of crops, ripen crops. A supply of anything gathered at maturity and stored. The verb to harvest means to gather, to reap to catch, to take, to remove. How interesting. To collect. Elul 2017 will be the last month of the Hebrew year 5777. That 777 in Gematria means it should be a year of completion. Both 2017 and 5777 have messianic prophecies that are associated with them and these are not even from the Christian perspective. We're just trying to reach out to the skeptics and the Jews and letting you know that your own rabbis uh, prophesied of this. Rabbi Judah ben Samuel had a prophecy of the year 2017, and that's an 800-year-old prophecy. We're about to come to the fulfillment of an 800-year-old prophecy. We're days away. Rabbi Mir, Halavi, Horowitz had a prophecy of the year 5777. It's the same year. But again, I don't stake my life on Jewish prophecy. You take it or leave it. But I believe there's a lot of confluence of signs. Many conjunctions and alignments of signs pointing to this season. 2017, 2018. Time will tell. Do we have control over the time? No, we don't need to even worry about that. Only God will decide when His Son comes and when we go. So what do we do? While we live here, we just have a little bit more excitement and live a little bit more passionately, forgive a little more quickly, yeah? Be a little bit more difficult, holding grudges. Just be a better person. Let's just be better people. Leave the timing in God's hand, but live to the fullest. I'd serve God to the fullest. I'd give to the maximum. I'd go on mission if I can. I'd just be kind and nice to everybody. And I wouldn't even leave. Every time I'm with people now, any opportunity, I will share Jesus. I said, Lord, sometimes it's not easy. I said, Lord, I'm just, I'll pray under my breath. Lord, give me an opportunity to share Jesus in a way that this person can understand. And sometimes it's kind and soft, and sometimes it's direct and blunt. Depends on the person. Depends how proud or how humble they are. But I wouldn't waste any opportunity now. People come knock on my door. They want to sell something. Would you like to hear about this? Well, would you like to hear about my YouTube channel? No thanks. Well, then no thanks. Bye-bye. It's got to work both ways, right? Don't be a one-way street and expect it's going to work. You want me to hear something? You hear something. But if God sent you all the way to my house, I'm going to give something to you. And we got bookmarks. We got YouTube cards. We got all sorts of resources you can use. Do it. Take the opportunity now. Live, live to the fullest. 
So there appears a marker in the sky at the end of 5777, or the beginning of 5778. This is the Revelation 12 sign, two days, two, two or one day before the new year, the Feast of Trumpets. That's coming on the 23rd of September. There appears a marker on the earth, right? At the end of 2017, the great American solar eclipse. So this is going to darken the earth. It's actually going to kind of mark out a path of maybe this is where God's focus is, America, time to repent or be judged. There's a sign, a marker on the earth. 33 days before the Revelation 12 sign. Interesting number. Which will then, we're not even done, which will then be followed by another total solar eclipse seven years later. The sun is a sign to the Gentiles or the nations. The sun is bigger. The moon is smaller. The moon is a sign to the Jews or the nation of Israel. The solar eclipse seems to be a warning of judgment on the Gentile or on the Gentile nations. So the last time that a total solar eclipse crossed the United States was in 1918, June 8th, 1918. So now we, we want to move towards prophecy slash an educated speculation. How do we determine, how do we say what might be coming? Because we want to prepare people. What might be coming? Well, all we have to do is look at history. History is prophecy. Right? Patterns are prophetic. So you can get a direct word from the Lord or you can also just study and see what history says. What happened in history when there was a total solar eclipse crossing the entire continental United States nearly 100 years ago? Well, if you look in history, you can Google this. <clears throat> 1918, there was a flu pandemic. A pandemic is bad. It's not an epidemic. It's a pandemic. The pandemic of 1918 resulted in a death toll of 675,000 Americans dead, 1918. The population was smaller back then. The death toll worldwide was 50 to 100 million. I mean, give or take 50 million. That's how bad it was. So would you say that's a sign that was given to that generation? To say, boy, there's a lot of wickedness here and repent, repent or reap what you sow. God doesn't go around killing people. We don't believe that. But God would only need to remove his presence for evil to come into your life. The reason you're not dead is because there was a grace of God over your nation and over you. God doesn't cause evil, but he just withdraw because he's been rejected enough times. He says, well, I don't want to impose on you. Have it your way. And that's what we're doing to God. We kick him out of school. We say you can't even teach the Bible in school. You can see the demonic influence in that. Why would you single out a book and say that's not allowed? But of course you can glorify Islam. You can talk positively about the Quran. But the Bible singled out. That told me even as a sinner, as somebody who didn't believe in Jesus in the beginning, that told me something is different about Jesus. I knew from my travels and from just seeing the different religions. I was very open-minded. I looked at those religions. But there was only one that everybody really picked on and hated. So we may be looking at an outbreak of a pandemic. But I want to show you something else that might be a clue. If you look at the path of totality of the eclipse, and then you look at this earthquake hazard map, which is put out by the USGS, you can see the Cascadia is there, starting on the left side. Yellowstone is another hot spot. And then they found that there's another surprising earthquake zone called now the New Madrid. Surprising because it's right in the middle of the country. You wouldn't think that it'd be there. Now take a look at this. If you impose, superimpose the path of totality over the earthquake hazard zones, it's like a, like a perfect match. Starts from one subduction zone and goes over to the New Madrid zone. This is FEMA's earthquake projected earthquake damage zones. The red would be the worst. Yellowstone's there, New Madrid's there, and the sun marks it out. On the 21st of August, the sun says, we're crossing all of those earthquake zones. 
And by the way, this is also partially scientific because a lot of the geologists, they never can predict earthquakes because they look down. God always says, look up. There are now scientists who are looking up at solar activity, sunspots, coronal hole mass ejections, these things. And then they make predictions of earthquakes, and so far they have been doing it better than people who look down. Our weather, even earthquakes, even hurricanes, may in fact be influenced more by the sun than by anything going on down here. It's a metaphor. It's a metaphor of our lives. Try to figure out our lives by just looking at stuff on the earth. And God says to figure out your life, you have to stop looking at stuff here and look up. Look up, look up, look up. That's what Jesus said. So we now see the first total solar eclipse crossing the United States in 2017. Then there's going to be a second total solar eclipse crossing the United States seven years later. On the 8th of April, 2024. First of all, what's interesting about the 8th of April is it just so happens, if you believe in coincidence, it just so happens to be the first of Nisan, year 5884. Nisan is a religious holiday. It's a moed. A moed. We talked about the moedim, the feasts of the Lord. This is a feast. This is an important day. Nisan the first, the religious new year. So you put those two together, it looks like there's a cross there, a bullseye. And what is that, that bullseye? It's very interesting. It's the New Madrid seismic zone. But not only that, if you look carefully at the map, you see several states have a boundary that's been defined by two rivers. You see that? It's the Mississippi, the big one, and the small one is the Ohio. So it crosses, that cross, that X marks the spot, goes right over the, uh, the seismic zone, and it goes over the place where the rivers meet. Now why is this interesting? Because the rivers divide the land into three at that part. Now, the Bible says in Isaiah 18, verse 7, in that time, referring to the end time, a present will be brought to the Lord of hosts from a people tall and smooth of skin whose land the rivers divide. Whose lands the rivers divide. The Ohio and the Mississippi rivers join at exactly where the paths of totality, totality cross each other. Revelation 16, verse 17, talks about the seventh bowl. This is the very end of the predictions of Revelation. Then the seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air, and a loud voice came out of the temple of heaven from the throne, saying, It is done. And there was a great earthquake, such a mighty and great earthquake as had not occurred since men were on the earth. Verse 19, Now the great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell, and great Babylon was remembered before God to give her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. Verse 20, the final event. And great hail, that's meteorites, fell from heaven upon men. Men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, since the plague was exceedingly great. Got rocks falling in your head? You should know it's time to repent. So the question is, we know for sure Babylon the Great will be split into three. The question is, is America the modern Babylon the Great? And I touched on this in the 22 future events predicted in Revelation. Right? So if you want to just study all four, it's fine. If you want to study the, the fourth one, the seven bowls, I go into detail about this conjecture. Is it possible that Babylon is not only modern-day Saudi Arabia and Iraq, but really this great economic power that's talked about in the end time, no one compares to it. No one compares to America. So it may be America as well. Babylon the Great will be split into three. What would that look like? Why is America important? Why are we talking so much? Because sometimes people ask, you're an Australian and you're over here. Well, because I care about Australia. I have to preach about America. Because America influences us so much. America is the linchpin, hindering the spread of globalism. 
I didn't say global trade. We like free trade because that's choice. That's not force. You don't make me buy something. I choose to buy something from another country. That's free trade, global trade. That's good. But globalism means total political control over your personal data, your personal finance, your personal movement. In one word, your personal life. And some bureaucrat that doesn't know me wants to control everything about me? No, thank you. That's globalism. And America, especially under Trump, is hindering that. Trump is a setback to globalism and its anti family, anti liberty, anti Christianity agenda. And this is why the elites hate him. The Republican elite hate him as much as the Democrat elites. That tells me he has to be good. If, that, if those people hate him, I like him. National sovereignty, something that God created. God made nations. National sovereignty is a godly idea, but it's a roadblock to the new world order. What's the new world order? It's enslaving humanity to the Western banking system. Don't you know that's what's happening? Don't you know that's why all the governments are running debts? Debts means wealth to the globalists. Your debt is somebody else's wealth. Doesn't that make sense? So when the government spends money it doesn't have, it's charging its collective federal credit card. What is it doing? It's enslaving the nation, you, to some power you've never agreed to be enslaved under. That's the new world order. And people are being hoodwinked into accepting this. Millennials think it's cool. What's wrong with, you know, just open up all the borders. We're one, man. We have peace, man. I'm going to talk about that next week, the millennials, because that's prophetic, because we're going into the millennium, and they already call themselves millennial. That tells you how close we are to the millennium. The main enemies of globalism are Trump, Russia, Syria, and China. In fact, if, they, if Trump, Trump's getting educated fast, he likes to talk with people, he likes to hang out with, with you know, people who have the right information, and he's learning. But he, take it from me, if he just watched this video, he would know. If you just make an alignment between America, Russia, China, and Syria, globalist power is over until, Jesus, until the tribulation, until Christians are out of here. So they're trying to cause all this conflict and fighting when in fact these guys are very open. There's Christian revival in China. There's Christian revival in Russia. And that's why they hate those countries. Because Christianity is a hindrance to this idea of we will control you. Why? Because we will be like God to you. We will take care of you. We will look after you. What are they doing? They're saying they're God. How can some politician be my God? They don't know enough. They're not smart enough. Of course there are exceptions. That's the hope. There are some exceptions, but they're, they're the exception. They're the minority. How can these people who have done nothing, most politicians have done nothing. They, they haven't built, you know, a real estate empire like Trump has. They haven't created jobs for anybody. They wouldn't know how to fix anything. What's your qualification to run my life? I'm going to hand over power to you so you run my life? And we call that world peace and love. You, no, that's tyranny. Dumb people ruling over me is a sad day. I'd rather rule over myself. I'd rather keep my taxes and make my own decisions. Keep tax to a minimum level, and then I'll decide what to do with my money. You don't need to take care of me. I'll take care of myself. My last point here is a lot of people will say, God will not do this. God's not going to judge America. In a certain sense, it's true. It's not yet the time that God's going to judge America. We use this term loosely, God's judging. Well, not really. It's just you're reaping what you sow. It's hard to fathom that something bad might happen to America. A French historian named Alexis de Tocqueville traveled to the United States in 1831, and I recently made a trip like this, and I gathered some firsthand accounts and experience and information. I haven't written a book, but he wrote a book called Democracy in, in America in 1835. That's when it was published. And he made this quote. It's attributed to him. It might not be exact, maybe a paraphrase, but there's a, there's a quote that's attributed to him, ascribed to him. America is great because America is good. 
So he went to America, and, and people were trying to figure out how come they're so strong. They're a young nation. Like we sing about Australia, we are young and free. You know, Australia Fair, our national anthem. We're young and free. I don't know when we're going to change the song because we're going to become like an old person. Eventually, we're still singing, "We're young and free." It's kind of a bad confession. You don't want to be young forever. You want to mature. But anyway, people are trying to figure out how come America at such a young age they just like they burst out of the gate so strong. What's different about them? And he said, "What made America great was was what was being preached." In the pulpits of America, he said America is great because America is good. And then he made this prediction: when America ceases to be good, America will cease to be great. And this is where America is at right now. She has a decision to make because you're split fifty-fifty. The goodness is still there, but a lot of evil, a lot of globalist, anti-Christian, left-wing agenda is also there. It's nearly fifty-fifty. And my experience this time, and I met some people that I haven't even seen for 20 years, and talked to them. And my experience is, even the good side of America is looking pretty faded. The glitter is gone. What do I mean? I mean, one person I talked to, he's been worshiping. He's been the one, a singer in the choir of a church, and he told me bluntly. He says he doesn't believe that. God is real, but he's been singing in the choir of the church. Another lady has been going to church, discuss sermons, talk about what her pastor teaches, and she just bluntly told me, "I I love Jesus. I believe everything. You know, I believe Jesus. I just don't believe in a physical resurrection, but I'm a Christian." So the American brand of Christianity is pretty near heretical. The pulpits are not fiery like they were in 1776, and even before. America is an old country, you know. There have been people there before 1776. That's when America was founded. But they've been there for you know since 1492. It's not, it's not young. It's a pretty mature place. And there's a lot of godliness and good sermons that were preached and revivals that made America good, and that's what made America great. Can't have a great nation without good people. Cannot be. So right now, from what I personally saw in America, as much as I love America, and as difficult as it is to e- even imagine to conceive that judgment could fall on America on the order of a major earthquake, major meteor hit, something ca- catastrophic like that, it does look like America has. Uh, turn her back on what made her good, and I think there's hope for America. I think if they pray and repent, you know, Trump is a a great anti-establishment leader. So you don't have to be hoodwinked by the media and by the elite politicians. There's a chance, but it's a pretty slim chance. And if they don't take it now, I think it's it's do or die. I don't think there's a a point of turning back for America, because the forces of the left will be like a flood. And Jesus says the end will come like a flood. When goodness is gone, evil is rampant. You can see the rioting and the hatred and the violence. People who lived in America told me they've never seen that before. Well, why didn't you see that before? Because Americans were good. But now they've twisted it. We'll cover that next time. All right. Let me close by saying Ezekiel 33. If the watchman sees the sword coming and does not blow the trumpet. There's that trump again, and the people are not warned. And the sword comes and takes any person from among them. He is taken away in his iniquity, but his blood I will require at the watchman's hand. Who's the watchman? Church, who's the watchman? We are. You need to say, "I am. I am the watchman." And when you see it coming, and you go, "La di da," you know, same old, same old. They've been predicting the end of the world. I didn't predict the end of the world. I'm predicting judgment upon a nation that's turned away from God. We need to take that seriously. We need to tell people. God said, "When I say to the wicked, 'O wicked man, you shall surely die, and you do not speak to warn the wicked from his way, that wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood I will require at your hand.'" Nevertheless, if you warn the wicked to turn from his way, 
and he does not turn from his way, he shall die in his iniquity, but you have delivered your soul. I preach this out of my own self-interest. Not only because I love you, America, I love the people, the Gentiles will probably get judged as well, but in my own self-interest, I will deliver my soul by being faithful to tell the truth before it happens. God speaks, God does predict, and he's never stopped. And I'm not trying to be right, I wish I was wrong. I'm not trying to prove myself, I'm just saying, I'm a watchman, my job to warn. Timing up to God. Solar eclipse, is it going to fall on the date, judgment on that date? Probably not. If it does, it would be pretty undeniable. But God has a leeway. These signs come. You saw since Nineveh. You saw in World War I. There's a leeway of months. Something's coming. The 21st of August, 2017, to the 8th of April, 2024, is a seven, appears to be a seven-year countdown. The dates coincide with the first of Elul, the month of harvest, 5777, and then the first of Nisan, the religious new year, in 5784. I think that a major earthquake or a plague or meteorite strikes are being foretold. And many believers are expecting the rapture. And I think that would be a wise thing to prepare for. Start treating people with love. Start loving God, obeying God, because you don't want to miss the rapture. Amen. Nothing is worth that. Huge earthquake happening there would split the nation into three. That's what new America would look like. Split into three like that. Is that what I'm prophesying? No. I'm just saying that's entirely possible, and it would be wise to make some preparations. And that's what you being saved looks like. You're not accepting Jesus like you're giving him a favor. You're a drowning person who can't save himself. You're in ice cold water, your muscles are frozen, and you're about to die and you say, Jesus! And suddenly he appears and reaches out. And you take Jesus as your lifesaver. He is doing you a favor by telling you the truth, by dying for you on the cross, by resurrecting from the dead and defeating Satan. He is doing us a favor. And our job after hearing all this is to make a decision for Jesus before the disasters happen. You don't have to be motivated by fear alone. You should, out of self-preservation, say, since this is true, I would rather follow what is true. So I want to invite everyone to pray this prayer and those who are watching to pray this prayer to take Jesus' hand and say, please save me out of whatever trouble I'm sinking into. Close your eyes and bow your hearts. If you'd like to make Jesus Lord of your life, today is the day. All you need to do is just take his hand and say humbly a prayer. Say these words after me and God the Father will hear and answer. Say, dear Lord Jesus, I turn from my wicked ways. I take the hand of Jesus, the one who died on the cross for me, the one who defeated my enemy, the one who rose again after three days. I take your hand. Rescue me out of my sins, out of my problems, out of my depression. Save me. Wash me clean. Make me your own. Use my life. Make it count. I want to live a purposeful life. From this day forward, guide me and lead me. Take me to the right church. Give me new and better friends who will encourage me to grow spiritually. I commit my life to you. I'm entirely yours from this day forward. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. I bless you. If you made that decision, it's the best decision. I did that 22 years ago. So another 22. 22 is everywhere. I'm so glad that you're a Christian now. If you made that decision here, again, welcome to the family of God. Keep growing. Get, to, uh, get a Bible. Read it. 
get to, you know, home group, cell group, care group, whatever your church calls it. Get in fellowship with people. This is not the time to be isolated. And one of the tactics of the devil right now is to isolate people. Don't do that, okay? Get, get whatever you need to do to clear your schedule. Be around strong Christians. If somebody's harassing you and abusing your faith and mocking your faith, maybe just take a break from them and just say, Lord, I need to hang around strong people, people who have a lot of faith, and then you'll grow as well, okay? So it really helps to be mentored by a human. I'm glad you're watching YouTube and video, but you also need a human, okay? So ask God for that in Jesus' name, amen. See you next time on the video and keep looking up. If we get to see you again, I'll be back with another fresh word from the Lord.